Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. This is a special sermon, a standalone sermon, and its title is Finding Jesus in the Old Testament. Our reading is taken from the book of Numbers, and we'll be reading from chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. So this is Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bidden, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bidden anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. This is the word of the Lord. I've been a teacher for 20 years. That means that I've met and interacted with thousands of children. Over time, teaching methods and philosophies of education change. Teachers today don't follow the same pedagogy that they did 50 years ago. One of the things that never changes, however, is that children always enjoy puzzles. If I give my students a word search, a scrambled word puzzle, or a hidden items picture, they're always very happy. When you look at a lot of mystery pictures, you become attuned to looking very carefully. You begin to recognise shapes and patterns. With practice, you can better see what is hidden. We have an idiom in English for someone who can see things very well. We say that they are sharp-eyed. When it comes to God's revelation, we also want to look carefully and be sharp-eyed. We know that as Christians, our great interest is the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to have our eyes fixed constantly upon him. We know that in our Bibles, he appears in person in the four Gospels, and the beginning of the book of Acts. Then he departs and leaves this world to rejoin the Father. And those are the only places that we can find the Lord Jesus, right? No, of course, that's wrong. This is not what the Bible says. Following the resurrection, Jesus joins two of his followers on the road to Emmaus. As they walk along, Jesus gives them the greatest Bible study ever. We read in Luke twenty four twenty seven the following... And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wouldn't you have liked to have been able to listen in on that conversation? Jesus tells these men that he appears through the whole of the Bible. It's all about him. But, and this is very important, in the Old Testament he appears in types, shadows, figures or patterns. He's not always plain and easy to see. It's as though he's hidden in the picture. Today we're going to find a type of Christ in a very interesting and unusual story. When I speak here of type, I mean an example of something in the Old Testament that is later fulfilled in the life or ministry of Christ. Sometimes, just as with a hidden picture, the types are hard to see. Without having them pointed out, we may miss them. But in this case, we know for sure that it is a type of Christ, because the Lord Jesus himself affirmed this to be the case. But well, let's begin. Before we begin and look at today's scripture passage, let me give you a little background. Today's account is taken from the book of Numbers. Numbers tells us about the 40 years the people of Israel spent wandering around in the wilderness. The book begins with Moses taking a census, counting all of the people. And this is, of course, where we get the name that we give the book today, Numbers. But the Hebrew name is much more descriptive. In Hebrew, it is called Bemidbar, 
which means In the Desert. Isn't that a much better title for this book? Our story today picks up shortly after the death of Aaron and God's people being victorious against the Canaanite king Adad. We begin then with verse number four. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Who of you enjoys hiking? A nice walk in the mountains for a couple of hours is very enjoyable. How about a stroll through the desert? Mm, perhaps not so enjoyable. How about a 40-year hike through the desert? Well, that's no fun at all. Back in Numbers 20, Moses had asked permission to take a shortcut through the land of Edom on their way to the Promised Land. But the king of Edom had refused, and therefore God's people were forced to turn back and go around the borders of Edom. How discouraging for the people. It meant even more walking, because it was in the opposite direction to the Promised Land. It's not surprising, therefore, that the people began to feel miserable and discouraged. They were, by this point, very impatient to get to the Promised Land. It wasn't long, therefore, before the people began, began grumbling. Well, let's read on. Verse number five. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. The period of time that the Israelites spent in the wilderness was frequently punctuated by bouts of complaining. Typically they complained about Moses. Pharaoh was being hard on them because of Moses. They were hungry and thirsty. Moses was a bad leader. The air conditioner kept breaking down. OK, not that last one. On 13 separate occasions, the people spoke directly against Moses. Of course, when they did this, they were really complaining against God. But here, though, on the 14th and final round of complaining, they are far more brazen. Here they openly criticise and are angry with God. This is clear rebellion against God. It's hard, perhaps, for us to believe that they would do such a thing. God, remember, had brought them out of slavery and provided all that they needed during 40 years in the wilderness. Their anger here is centred on the bread or manna that God provided every morning. God, you see, provides what we need, not necessarily what we want. They wanted bread made from wheat, barley or corn, and they were sick of the manna that God gave them. The manna they had determined was miserable or worthless. But in rejecting this bread, they were in effect rejecting God's grace. This is a very serious issue. We never deserve or can earn God's favour. And he gives it to us because he loves us. So to throw that kindness back in his face is a truly terrible thing to do. It's something that we would never do today. Don't you agree? I wish that were true. But just like the ancient people of Israel, we, are, we too are prone to complaining. Some of us complain all the time, and some of us just part of the time. Oh, I hate living in this city. I don't like my job. I wish I had a nicer husband, wife, boyfriend or girlfriend. I wish I had a boyfriend or girlfriend. Why does nobody find me attractive? There are so many things for us to moan about. I think many of us living here in prosperous Korea have it too good. I doubt Koreans in the past complained about only having a bowl full of rice and kimchi. I bet your grandparents or great-grandparents were just glad to have something to put inside their bellies. Today, with our refrigerators full, we often forget to be thankful. So my message is simple. Stop complaining and start being grateful to God. So God here is fully justified in being angry with this rebellious people. Let's see what he does. Verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. What are your feelings about snakes? In the UK, we don't have many snakes, and only one species that is poisonous. So as a consequence, I'm not very bothered by snakes. But people who come from places where deadly snakes live often have much stronger reactions to snakes. 
The snakes that the Lord sends to discipline his people are certainly worthy of fear. They are described here as being fiery serpents. Now we cannot be sure in what way they were fiery. Were they actually fire breathing? Well, that's a possibility. Or does the expression fiery describe the effect of their bite? When they bit people, did it cause an intense burning sensation? Well, this is possibly certainly true too. But maybe fiery describes their physical appearance. Perhaps they were a red or orange colour. Maybe it just describes their aggressive nature. In Egypt and other parts of Africa, today you can find the red-spitting cobra. It is a beautiful salmon red in colour. So perhaps the fiery serpents looked a little like this. Whatever the case, these fiery snakes bit many of the people and they died. What will the people do? Well, let's read on and find out. Verse number 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The fiery snakes are highly effective in changing the hearts of the people. The prospect of an instant and painful death often brings people to their senses. The people realise that it is their sin, their rebellion against God, that has brought this judgment upon them. They came to Moses and asked for him to intercede on their behalf. As I spoke about in my introduction, we often see types and shadows in the Old Testament. Moses is also a type. He is a type of Christ. He serves here as an intercessor between the people and God. The people want him to pray, petition or beg God to show them mercy, to take these horrible snakes away. So Moses goes before God to ask for him to be merciful to the people. And this is exactly what Jesus does for us. So Moses prays. Let's find out what happens. Verses 8 and 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. God gives Moses a set of instructions to follow. Firstly, he is to make a fiery serpent of his own. He makes it out of bronze, which most likely resembled the colour of the real snakes that were biting the people. But there may also be another reason for selecting bronze. You see, bronze is a metal often associated with judgment in the Bible. Bronze is an alloy, a mix of two different kinds of metal, usually copper and tin. It has to be heated to a very high temperature in order to be melted. It has to pass through the fire of judgment in order to achieve the shape and size that the craftsman desires. In a similar kind of way, believers come through the fire of God's judgment and as a result are tougher and can be better shaped into what God desires. Secondly, he is to attach the model or the image of the snake to a pole and finally, we assume that this pole is fixed into the ground so that people are able to see it clearly. What effect does all this have? Very simple. Salvation from the pain and inevitable death from the snake bites comes through looking at the snake on a stick. God, in his mercy, provides a means by which those who have sinned and rebelled against him can be saved. All that they have to do is to look at the bronze serpent, and God saves them. Isn't that amazing? Despite their wicked sin of being critical and dismissive of God, he was still going to do all the work necessary to save them. Isn't that an interesting and slightly strange story? It has all the ingredients needed to make a great Hollywood movie, a picturesque setting, bad people, conflict, killer snakes death, redemption, and ultimately a happy ending. But more importantly, did you see Jesus in it? Did you see how it was a type or example of what Jesus would do much later on in history? 
Let us leave the Israelites in the wilderness, looking at a bronze snake on a stick, and jump forward to John's Gospel. These verses are taken from Jesus' conversation with the Pharisee Nicodemus. We can read this in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So our Lord and Saviour tells us that the bronze serpent on a pole was a type of himself. Here's what he means. Let us think our way very carefully through this. How was the Lord Jesus lifted up? To lift up can be used as an expression meaning to hold or to regard in high esteem. The Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, must be held up and regarded of primary importance. Our entire destiny depends upon our relationship to him. But here lifted up is intended in a literal sense. The Lord Jesus was lifted up on a cross in order to be crucified. Those that were in Jerusalem at that time would have been able to look up and see him hanging on the cross. In the same way the people in Moses' day could look up and see a bronze snake fixed to a pole. But of course there is much more to this than just this visual symbolism. We must consider the practical outcome of looking up at the snake and at Jesus. Those people in the wilderness who had been bitten and were dying had no hope. The snake's venom was too powerful. It would soon overwhelm their immune system. The physicians of that day could not help. There was no anti-venom to administer. But God in his mercy provided a cure, a means of salvation. All that it required was that the people follow an elaborate process, make a sacrifice and then pray. No, all it required was that they look at the snake and have faith. Underlying this, of course, was the necessity that the people repent of their sin of rebelling against God. The people must trust that God could do all that was necessary to save them. Perhaps these people thought that this whole thing was rather strange. Snakes, after all, were typically associated with evil and sin. So despite all this, they must put their trust in God. And what about Jesus? Human beings since the fall live in a sin-filled world. Our hearts are just like the Israelites, naturally rebellious towards God. The poison of sin runs like a snake's venom through our bodies. It's perhaps not as dramatic or immediate as being poisoned by a snake, but ultimately it will kill us. Our physicians cannot cure us. There is no anti-venom that we can take. There is nothing we can do. But God in his mercy provided a cure, a means of salvation. All it requires is that we go to church every week, live a good life, help poor people and pray every day. No, all it requires is that we look upon the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of our sins and have faith in him. You see, the sacrifice upon the cross of our Lord and Saviour meant the end of Satan's hold upon us. The serpent's venom holds no power. The serpent bit the heel of Jesus, but he stomped on the head of Satan and crushed him. Because of what Jesus did, we are free. We have eternal life. Let me bring things to a conclusion. We saw in the strange account of the serpent on a stick that God provided a means of salvation for his people. It was not something that they deserved, but God was gracious. That is the very definition of grace, receiving something that we do not deserve. This whole incident was a type of a much better salvation that was to come. You see, those who had been bitten by snakes recovered when they looked upon the serpent on the stick. But later they would suffer and die again. When we look upon Christ, repent and put our faith in him, we are gifted with eternal life in his presence. This is not something that you can earn and definitely not something that you deserve. We all, by rights, deserve death. But how gracious the God that we serve is. 
If you have not accepted this free gift, well, what on earth are you waiting for? And if you have put your faith in Christ, be grateful and try to live a life that pleases and honours God.